A blocked punt and second half surge gets the Saints win number 11 in Tampa. But is there concern with the Saints' inconsistent offense? We'll discuss. Plus, a thrilling rematch between Carr and Easton in the Dome, while Amy, Kentwood, and Curtis all win state titles too. And Tulane preps for its first bowl game in five years. For a half, it looked rough for the Saints. Six quarters of bad offense, and then one special teams play sparked, sparked a comeback, and tonight New Orleans celebrates a division championship again. I'm Doug Mouton. Welcome to Fourth Down on Four, and thanks to the Bears, the Saints are now the number one seeds in the NFC again. So who made the biggest difference in Florida today? That's our Fourth Down on Four poll question. Was it Taysom Hill and his game-changing punt block, or Cam Jordan, his two sacks, and the way he keyed a great defense? Offensive effort, or was it Mike Thomas and his 11 catches to carry the offense? Vote now on our mobile app or our website, wwltv.com slash vote. Andrew Doak kicks us off with the story from Tampa. For a game and a half, it seemed like the rut the Saints fell into was going to be more than a quick pit stop in Dallas. On the Bucks' opening drive, they marched down the field in seven plays and scored in just two minutes and 41 seconds. But it was the Saints' offense that continued to lack any sort of rhythm, something that even dumbfounded their head coach. If I knew it wouldn't take a little while, then. <laughs> the Saints saw their four drives during the first half killed by penalties, poor blocking, and truly just a lack of juice and energy. Brees had two turnovers for the first time all season. One came in the form of an interception right before the half, and the other came just two plays into the second half. Meanwhile, the Bucks jumped out to a 14-3 lead. Both of Jameis Winston's touchdowns came in the first half, and both were to his tight end, Cameron Bray. Jameis is playing, you know, was trying to play at a high level. We had to match that intensity. Uh, we let him score that uh, with that first drive, and we had to tighten up our defense. Defensively, the game was spiraling out of control for the Saints. Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara had a total of just two rushing yards on nine carries after the Saints' first six drives. But it was the play of Taysom Hill that was the absolute X factor today. He's now thrown a pass, caught a pass, rushed for a touchdown, returned kicks on special teams, and even recorded tackles. But today, his blocked punt was an absolute turning point that changed the trajectory of this game. I've been a part of football for a long time, and this is a type of game where, like we as a special teams unit, we need to make a big play to change momentum here. And, uh, you know, that was our mindset as a, a special teams unit, and that's what we we're hoping for. Anytime you get a block punt or a big punt return or a turnover, you know, that, that, that gives the team a lot of momentum. And we were able to get that block punt, get a short field, convert for a touchdown, and we took off from there. Then the offense caught fire. They scored touchdowns on three of their final four drives. And five plays later, Breeze hit Zach Line for a touchdown. And trailing by five, Peyton elected to go for two and got it. I felt real good about what we had um, because we hadn't been inside the five, and so we really hadn't utilized a lot of calls maybe that we would have. Trailing by three, the ensuing drive, Breeze finished things off with a classic stretch and score for an 18-14 lead. And then on their third straight series, Ingram barreled his way for 17 more and a score to give New Orleans a 25-14 advantage as the Bucks crumbled. During that time, the defense continued to hold strong. Cam Jordan had two sacks for the third straight game. He and Sheldon Rankins have combined for 20 sacks this season. Like I said, I, I've never had, you know, interior like the uh, interior push from Sheldon Rankins like this. Um, he's clearly coming up into his own. It was like watching two different games today at Raymond James Stadium and truly two different teams. And the Saints are hoping the one that started in a rut is one they never see again. To be able to win a game maybe where you didn't play your best one certain area or another was uh, was significant. That's our first goal every year, is to be division champs and for us to be able to come out and be gritty and resilient in this game and be able to close out our division back to back. From Raymond James Stadium, Andrew Doe, fourth down on four.
All right, thanks, Andrew. Joined by Seth Dunlap from WWL Radio. Should we be worried about this offense? They were terrible against Dallas and not good for a half against Tampa. Well, first of all, you got to remember that Dallas is one of the best defenses in the National Football League. They proved it again tonight against Philadelphia. So I don't think that you take a game and a half of football and you say you're worried about this offense. You just don't. This happens in the NFL over a 16-game season. You can't overreact. I was having people tweet at us and tweet at our station, Doug. I don't know if you saw this on social media. Wanted to completely jump off the bandwagon and have time so short answer to that is no don't worry yet this offense is going to be fine yeah and and the defense the great thing is as you watch this game cam jordan and the defense continues to get better they held tampa one of the best offenses in the nfl really underrated offense to under 100 yards in the second half 100 yards and i think actually the key is the interior of that defensive line if you look at what sheldon rankins is doing he's allowing cam jordan on that edge and also now marcus davenport on the edge to really play better and if you look at over the last 10 games now they're averaging about 17 points a game against by their opponents this is one of the better defenses in the national football league if they're going to win a Super Bowl championship the offense we know is going to be there at least it should be it's going to be because of that defense and Sheldon Rankins he's going to have a massive payday coming up with how he's playing he's probably right there behind Aaron Donald and a couple of other guys top five defensive tackle in the National Football League right now and Cam Jordan we mentioned him a, a second ago unbelievable season continues for him this is one of the five best I think defensive linemen in the National Football League and he's got help now Doug mm -hmm. he's finally got help which is something he just hasn't had in his career and you're seeing it pay a lot of dividends it's fun to watch it's fun to watch this defense how long has it been since it's been fun to watch the Saints defense and the big play that turned things around is the special teams play you love seeing it and I agree with you I think the offense does come around even though we haven't seen it the last couple of weeks the, the special teams play from Taysom Hill was unbelievable today for what it meant for this game well it was so interesting the timing of that Bobby Abier had just tweeted out something with us that I don't know where Taysom Hill is today where is he next play it's the block punt which completely changed the complexion of that football game. Uh, Taysom's unbelievable. I mean, he, he should be, and it's going to be interesting because he doesn't return a lot. He should be an all pro special teams guy. He probably won't get that because he doesn't return, but that's how impactful he's been in that special teams unit this year. Yeah, no question. When you look forward, Saints and Rams, um, you, you saw the Saints beat the Rams fairly soundly a few weeks ago. Are they closer to even now maybe than they were a month ago? You know, I got to be honest. I had this conversation a lot this week with about four or five different people. Mm -hmm. I actually think the two teams that I'm worried about most in the NFC, look, Rams are good. Uh -huh. That offense is good. The two teams I'm worried about, Bears and the Cowboys with that defense. If there's two teams that I think can match up with the Saints' really good offensive line, slow down the run, pressure Drew Brees, I think it's those two teams. I just haven't seen it from the Rams' defense. I do not think, even in 2018 NFL football, I don't think you can win with a defense that is that inconsistent. I just don't. Yeah, and I don't disagree with you. All right. Last question and the money question of all of it. Yes or no? Do you think this team right now, the Saints, I mean, get to the Super Bowl? Yes. Yeah, they're my pick to get to the Super Bowl. And actually, if it's a Rams game that you're talking about, an NFC championship, which might be how it works out on the road, uh -huh. I don't know if that doesn't favor the Saints, actually, because the Rams are a better team on the turf, Doug. Yeah, no doubt. And, it's, and the home field advantage might be New Orleans, yep. even in Los Angeles. Seth Dunlap, terrific job. Thanks for joining us. We're back with more Fourth Down on Four in a minute. Coming up, we'll head to the Dome where Carr outlasted Easton in the 4A Finals and Curtis won its 27th state title, while a pair of Tangipaho teams take home trophies. But which Dome teams were the best across all nine classes? Renee Nato weighs in. And later, Tulane prepares for its bowl game with its new offensive coach in town. Fourth Down on Four is sponsored by the Sportsbook at Hollywood Casino Gulf Coast. Forget Vegas, you've got home field. What a weekend in the Superdome as four local schools are crowned state football champions. We'll start with the Battle of New Orleans as Carr completed an unbelievable three-peat. Ricardo LeCompte reports. But it's more than just these two schools. It's East Bank, West Bank. Two district rivals playing for something even bigger than just bragging rights. Warren Easton sought its first state championship in seven decades. Edna Carr sought the first three-peat by an Orleans Parish public school and a 27th consecutive victory. Being able to keep these kids humble and hungry, you know, after winning so many games straight, you know, we didn't really talk about it. You know, we just was trying to be about it. And I think that was the key part that, you know, knowing that all those past wins were other senior classes and these scenes, they really went out the right way. They went out the right way, but they didn't start it that way. 
The Cougars played from behind a 12-0 deficit after a quarter thanks to two touchdown runs by senior quarterback Lance Lejean. We hadn't gotten off to a, a, a good start all year, you know, so maybe, you know, we shouldn't have did that. <laughs> Knowing that we was going to play a Warren Eastern team that was going to come out hungry and throw that first punch, and that's what we talked about all week was, you know, punching back. Carr swung back, led by senior wideout Jahai Howard. The 4A most outstanding player rushed for two scores and caught a 31-yard touchdown pass from Leonard Kelly to extend the Cougs' lead to eight points in the fourth quarter. Easton had a chance late to tie the game. The Eagles in the red zone, but car linebacker Joseph Thomas ripped the ball away from the Easton ball carrier. The Cougars snagging a third consecutive state title. Scenes with preaching, like, do you want to be a bust or do you want to win it? And then we also had to preach to the younger guys, like, even though you're in the scene, you're a part of this program, and you know, y'all can finish y'all legacy of holding the trophy too. Even though one team left the field with a win, both made New Orleans victorious on the day. This matchup was the first time two city schools played for a state championship since 1978, when Jesuit and St. Augustine battled for a state championship. This was also the first time two public schools from Orleans Parish played for it all. This was a great game you know, for the city of New Orleans. And, you know, we were happy to play in it. Between these two great programs was, was real good for the city of New Orleans. Teams like this that, that's winning on and off the field. You know, both of these schools are A schools. Things that divide us bring us together. You know, this game that they brought together East Bank, West Bank, and we did it the right way. Reporting at the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. Two Orleans schools and two Tangipaho Power schools also got to the Superdome, but they didn't have to play each other. And both Amit and Kentwood won. Ricardo now has the Tangi twofer. It's been a minute since Amit City celebrated a state football championship. It was 14 years since our school, since our community, since our kids, since our program have hoisted a state championship. And it was way too long. We've been working for this since, you know, since 2004, you know, when we last won our championship. I made sure that our senior year, you know, we go out with a bang. The community partying like it's 2004 after the Warriors won state title number five for the program after a dominant performance over Welsh. Amy littered with Division One talent, and that talent showed against the Greyhounds, both on the defensive front and on offense, with Kentucky commit Amani Gilmore tossing six touchdowns. I'm just going to go out here and play my own game and let things come to me, stay calm, and I trust uh, what Cole Powell told me. A state final victory not as long for Kentwood, the Roos capturing Hardwood back in 2015. But last year's appearance in the 1A title game didn't go as planned against West St. John. Man, last year left us a bad taste in our mouth, you know, with the penalties and the turnovers, just a sloppy game, uncharacteristic of a rule football. And um, when we came in, you know, it was just like, hey, let's finish the job. We knew we had a great team coming back, and the scenes were motivated. This time, Kentwood won the turnover battle, forcing four Oak Grove turnovers. Quarterback T.J. Hookfin earned 1A Most Outstanding Player, throwing for three touchdowns and catching another from LSU commit Trey Palmer. I'm just blessed. Like, these are my brothers I grew up with, so he wanted to win it. And we came out this offseason, worked for it, and we got it. Kentwood and Amy making Tangipaho Parish proud after the Prep Classic. Reporting at the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Ricardo. Joined by our good friend, Renee Nato, Kennedy High School legend. All right, <laughs> looking back at what happened this weekend in the Superdome, to me, people are not talking enough about Bryce and the job that he has done at Carr. Three straight state championships. His teams play smart. They play hard. He uses his talent well. He has done a spectacular job at that school. 27 straight. You know how hard that is to do? <laughs> he is Tony Hall, who left Warren Easton after having a successful career and parlayed that into a job in college at Kansas. Bryce Brown, very, very similar. 
Uh, very high IQ coaches, Tony Hall and Bryce Brown, both played in college, mm -hmm. well respected. And Bryce Brown, like Tony Hall, knows this area very, very well. Someone, you got to strike when the iron's hot, Doug, and someone's going to go up to Bryce Brown. Okay, look, let's talk about the A meet twosome. Uh, Ishmael Sobscher and Devontae Lee, the wide receiver, um, they win a state championship. LSU's after them both. What's the latest on the recruiting of these two? I think LSU has a better shot at Devontae Lee, and I'm not sure what side of the ball he's going to play. He could be a wide receiver, a very, very good wide receiver, or an outside linebacker. Hmm. He could grow. He's got great skills. I think he would start off as a wide receiver. Sofser is, a, is an interesting situation. LSU may take him and his brother as a as a combination, mm -hmm. if you will. But Sofster reminds me of a guy, Doug, that I know you remember, Al Woods, mm -hmm. who was the number one defensive tackle. It didn't work out really well at LSU when he was there, but he's still playing in the NFL. My point is, Sofster uh, may have a learning curve when he gets there. He's got to drop some weight. He can be good, but he's got to know how good he can be, and he and he has to get it. But uh, when he gets to college, the, the uh, challenges he'll have, uh, you know, he's going to have to step up to the plate, if you will. Yeah, no question about it. Okay, you've seen nine state championship <laughs> teams. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, of those nine state champions, give me your top four high school teams in Louisiana. This is like the old school days of college football when they're not playing each other and you got to rank them. But give me who are the best four in the state of Louisiana? Okay, this is the think? BCS. This is the top four, Doug. Okay. okay, this is the number one seed, University High. Yeah. Number two, John Curtis. Yeah. I thought U High was number one last year, too. Okay, number three? Carr. Carr. Carr is awful good. And I'd love to see Carr and U High. And people would say, wow, I mean, Okay, Carr, I think, would, would, would have an interesting matchup with a, with a Curtis. And fourth would be Zachary. Yeah, Zachary With a was consecutive state championship in their belt, uh, to their credit. And also the way they beat West Monroe. Mm -hmm. And Keelan Brown, that quarterback at, at Zachary, is coming back for senior year. So that is a well-coached team. And uh, Coach Burrington has done a great job. But that's the top four. And I would love to see those four teams play because... You know, it would any one of those four teams could win it if they had a tournament between those four. No question about it. Renee, terrific job as always. Ricardo also has the story of John Curtis's state championship. For a storied program like John Curtis, going five years without a title can be considered a drought. And the pressure to end it could weigh heavy on a Patriot. But the only thing those players focused on going into the Division I final Saturday was beating the team that defeated them for the title last year. Losing last year hurts, you know, a lot. You know, you just have that bitter taste in your mouth and, and you have to go 365 days knowing that you lost <coughs> to that team that you were capable of beating. But unlike in last year's game, the Patriots were the ones getting out to a fast start. 21 points on the board in the first quarter. Curtis running all over the Bears. We needed to establish the run from the very beginning of the game, and, and we were able to do that. The unsung heroes in this thing are those five guys in the interior of the line and, and our tight end. Curtis finished with 437 rushing yards against Catholic. A stingy defense complemented the ground attack. The Patriots pressured Catholic quarterback Cameron Dartez a bunch in the contest, even forcing him to throw a pick six to senior Donald Clay, which put this game out of reach late in the third quarter. Our mantra was to keep the ball in front of us, get them on the ground, and let's play another play. Let's not give up uh, a 60-yard pass or a, uh, a big play that's going to let them score quickly. Make them earn it down the field. A championship effort, one this Curtis program is used to seeing under JT Curtis. His 50th season at the school ends with state title number 27. It's a great feeling playing for such a great coach because, you know, we worked so hard these last couple years, but... We came up short, unfortunately, and this year it was really on our minds. You know, we had that it factor, and we just felt like this was our year. It was destined. Reporting at the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. Still ahead, we'll go uptown where Tulane is gearing up for its bowl game with a new offensive coordinator, Will Hall, in town. We'll hear from him and the Green Wave after the break. The college bowl season opens Saturday and Tulane is up on opening day. A win in the Cure Bowl would make the Green Wave 7-6. and six. It would mark Tulane's first winning season under Willie Fritz and just their second in the last 16 years for a program that certainly appears to be headed in the right direction. Oh, 
A bowl appearance means you get some extra practice time in the winter, and that's great for a program on the rise. In Orlando at the Cure Bowl, the Green Wave faced the 7-6 and six UL Lafayette Ragin' Cajuns. You know, they got a big team, and uh, they played a really tough schedule as well. they got a good power running attack. They're just very well coached, and it's going to be a tremendous challenge for us. The Green Wave won four of its last five to get bowl eligible. LSU transfer Justin McMillan made the offense significantly better, but statistically, Tulane was much better on defense this season than offense, which prompted Willie Fritz to change offensive coordinators. Will Hall arrived on campus this week with a mission to run the ball more effectively. We'll build this thing from day one on going as fast as you could possibly go, knowing we've always want to have the ability to slow down. I've done a lot more. Uh, uh, of the triple option stuff, and we'll try to ingrain that into what, what he's doing. Will Hall's dad, Bobby Hall, is a Mississippi prep football coaching legend. Will Hall and Willie Fritz have crossed paths a bunch over the years, and Will Hall says he jumped at the chance to come to Tulane. I think everything's in place here. Uh, Coach Fritz and the staff have done a phenomenal job getting the program to this point, getting it to a bowl game, which is a huge step in the right direction. And, uh, you know, we got to get a little bit better, and, and that's what I'm here for is to help. The Cure Bowl is Saturday with an early kickoff, 12.30 in the afternoon in Orlando. It'll be broadcast on the CBS Sports Network. And Drew Holiday had 37 this afternoon as the Pelicans beat the Detroit Pistons for a rare road win. New Orleans evens its record at 14 and 14. They'll play in Boston Monday night. We're back with more fourth and on four in a minute. One play turned everything around today in Tampa, and for that one play, Taysom Hill is overwhelmingly the voters' choice as our player of the day today for the Saints. And remember, the Saints don't play again until next Monday in Charlotte against the Panthers. We're out of time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week on 4th Down on 4. Fourth Down on 4 has been sponsored by